Are hello. Hi. How are can you? Can you hear me good? I can. I can hear you really okay, good. good. Let me turn my. Can you hear me as well? I can. Okay, perfect. Welcome, Miss Dr. Nadia Lopez. Welcome. Um, I'm just typing in everything, typing in, you know, what we have no done. Problem. Okay. So, hey, everybody coming on. I see a lot of you joining. I'm excited about tonight's conversation. Like I mentioned earlier in one of my posts, for the whole month of October, since it's National Principals Month, I'll be interviewing school leaders for a series called Leading with Empathy Conversations with School Leaders. And today we have Dr. Nadia Lopez on, and I am super excited to talk, up, talk to her because she opened a school to close a prison. And that is one of the things that I plan on doing in the future. So I'm super excited to have you here. And I just want you to go ahead and introduce yourself for the people that don't know you. Hey, good people. Hey, Brian, I see you in here as well as Colin. Um, so I opened a school in 2010 um, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which if you look it up is um, they, depicted within the narrative of one of the most dangerous places in New York City. To me, it's the most brilliant space with the most amazing children. Um, and I did that for 10 years and then had to resign from my position um, because I wanted to choose life and also be able to impact education um, from a different lens and continue to be disruptive, um, but preserving myself first. I love it. And you said because you wanted to choose your, is you said choose yourself. Is that how you said choose life? That's what you said. I wanted to choose life. And so, so by choosing, I had to choose myself. Exactly. So can you elaborate a little more on that? Because I follow you, so I know your story. But, you mm -hmm. know, I just want you to go into how that looked for you. What happened? Okay. Um, so, you know, folks who are in the education space, you know that you tend to sacrifice yourself, whether you're a teacher or a leader. Um, you know, you go above and beyond for your children. You spend more time in the building than you do with your own families. And when you're a leader, you're not only in charge of a grade level or a group of children, you are in charge of the entire community. Um, so what that led to was me failing to eat. Like maybe I would eat once a day. And if I ate once a day, it was probably six or seven o'clock at night. I was running on drinking coffee just to have some type of like, you know, um, invigoration just, just to make it through the morning. Um, lack of water. I had insomnia really bad. You know, you tend to have paranoia. You, you, you don't sleep well because you're always stressed out about what's going to happen. You're always thinking of what you need to write down. Who didn't you talk to? Who do you need to talk to? So you know, there's a pendulum that happens when you're in, a, in, in the position of leader. You have those moments that you're very anxious. And then because you're looking at data and you know what you're up against, you have those moments that you're depressed. And then you have your own family and then you are a full human being. So you're trying to do all of these things. So as a result, I did develop, initially, I developed an autoimmune um, disorder that impacted my, my, my um, digestive system. And we all go through it if you're in education in some way, shape, or form. You know, your stomach starts to hurt. You take Tums or Rolaids or Pepto-Bismol, but it never really resolves. And it's what we call acid reflux, right? So you think it's just acid reflux, but when you don't take care of it and you don't minimize the stress, it literally starts to turn on your body. Your body then starts to attack itself. So I developed what's called encephalic esophagitis, and what that is, is that your white blood cells attack your esophagus. And so I couldn't sleep. I couldn't drink anything. I literally would have to go to the emergency room. They had to give me liquid lidocaine one time just to stop the peristalsis, which is your esophagus moving. And so it got progressively worse. So that's one issue I had to deal with. I dealt with the migraines. I dealt with the gas pain at night that would wake me up and I thought I was having a heart attack. But ultimately in 2019, because I was internalizing so much, right? And this is the part where I'm going to say to folks, getting therapy and seeking counsel is so important in this work because we tend to absorb everything. Vicarious trauma from our children, 
from our colleagues, from the community, all of the things. And so I literally um, started to internalize everything about work, which started to impact my organs, which ultimately affected my kidneys. As a result of that, I developed what's called Berger's syndrome or Berger's disease. And this is IJ nephropathy, which is my white blood cells attacking the antigens in my kidneys. And it was starting to cause my kidneys, like literally rejecting my kidneys. Mm -hmm. And so it took an entire year for me to um, go through the steroid treatment, change my diet, go to therapy. And I had to absolve myself of the guilt of I'm not at work, I'm not doing enough. And you know, what we what we never say is that we become saviors, right? We have like, we call it the Superman hero, the superwoman hero. It's, we become saviors because we feel like nothing can be done without us being present. And ultimately my doctor is at the, I was on a medical leave, but it was in the midst of, it was right before COVID. And then COVID happened and I jumped into the work to support my team because the Department of Education had no plan of action. And so I did what I do mm -hmm. and I was all hands on deck, even though we were virtual, but I was starting to do the same things as I would be in my office, not eating, not going to the bathroom, not drinking water, just glued to the computer, supporting my team, texting everybody. And then my doctors, I had to do blood work and were like, are you fasting? What's happening? And I said, you know, no. I'm not fasting. Why would I do that? Like, not right now. And then they were like, um, what are you doing? And I explained to them it was work related. And they was like, okay, you have three options. We talked about this before. You will either need dialysis, because that's what you're looking like. It will lead to you having to get a transplant, or you're going to die early death. Wow. Those are your three options. There's nothing else that's going to save you at this point. And so they said, the only thing is that you're going to have to change something about what you're doing when it comes to work. And there was no other change. Like I knew because of COVID, there still was no plan. I'm going to walk right back into a position where the demands are going to be 10 times harder. And my need to be with the children and to support my team and to do all the things, I will literally die in my job. And I cannot have my daughter, who I'm raising to be a strong Black woman, think that the only way she can exist is by sacrificing herself. So I made the executive decision and decided that I needed to resign um, and serve in a different capacity. So that's what I, I'm doing. Thank you for sharing that story because it speaks so much about toxic stress and how it can build mm -hmm. up in your body and literally cause you so many different ailments and illnesses. And like you said, ultimately a short death. And a lot mm -hmm. of educators, I think, like you were pretty much hinting on, don't really pay attention to those subtle things or not so subtle things. Because if you're going to bed every day and you have acid reflux or insomnia, those are sure signs of burnout. And what you yep. need to do really is, you know, really start to set boundaries and see what can wait and what can't wait and really start mm -hmm. to leave more and more of your work at home. And I know that is a huge thing that many educators battle with. And I battled with myself in the beginning, but I had a very bright mentor that told me from like day one, do not take your work home with you because the more work that you take home with you, the more they're going to expect you to do. So if you don't mm -hmm. get it done in school, don't bring it home. And I didn't listen at first. I was bringing reports home and I was writing reports. But then after a while, when I was, you know, my um, principal and the other school admins saw my output, they expected more of me. And I'm like, no, I, I, I can't give you anymore. I'm actually giving you more than I'm required to. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you spoke on that because especially during this time, where, you know, we're fresh out off of virtual learning and all, a lot of educators are really, really struggling with their mental and physical health because of the things that you just mentioned. So thank you so much for sharing that. Of so course. I want to know, what, what made you realize that leading with empathy actually worked? Because you have some leaders that lead with an iron fist and, you know, they just they're dictators in other words so what mm -hmm. made you come to the realization that that doesn't work and that you need to lead with empathy you know i 
so I think it's two things. One is my own personal experience in school. I came from, I went to school districts where they had very strong black leadership that believe in cultivating children of color and making sure that we felt safe and seen even though our zip codes may have been in some of the most high and highly impoverished neighborhoods. Um, the second thing is, well, three things. The second thing is just how my parents raised me, right? To my mother is very, very, very empathetic. Um, she's always taught me to care for others, to be mindful of what you say and how you say it. Um, and I would say the third thing is that my background is in nursing. Mm -hmm. And nursing requires you to be empathetic, right? Yeah. They teach you that from day one. You know, don't show people sympathy. Don't say you're sorry all the time. Have a better understanding of what someone is going through so that you can best support them and be a really, really good listener. Because the difference between a nurse and a doctor is the doctor is focused on the diagnosis. The nurse is focused on the behaviors. What led you to this situation? How can I best help you? And how can I best understand how to support you so that you can become better as not just as a patient, but just as a human being. So I recognize that when you treat people like human beings, that you speak to them in a way that they deserve to be spoken to, and you're willing to listen actively and not always try to give them all the answers or cut them off, that you actually can get people to be responsive and really think and be reflective so that it could create change. I absolutely agree. And that explains it because you were in nursing. And like you said, they teach you to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And you would think that they would teach educators to be empathetic as well because of the impact that they have on the students. And they're with them all day, just as much as the, uh, the parents are, pretty much. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned sympathy, not to be sympathetic. And I always talk about that in my trainings because there's a thin line between sympathy and empathy and sympathy mm -hmm. can really be damaging for the students and it can be degrading for the families as if you're sitting on this soapbox like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for you. I have this savior complex and you're the victim. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So I'm glad, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> so I want to know what are a couple of ways that you show your empathy with um, students teachers and families just like a couple of ways for each and i just want to shout out my friend sarita she jumped on hey sarita oh she um, said no <laughs> <laughs> so you know um for me i always believe my my initial way of being empathetic was to be fully present mm -hmm. i acknowledge every single person in my building i walked the building i was in classrooms in the morning, I was greeting children, greeting adults. I would walk down the hallways, go into classrooms, um, not for the purpose of evaluation, but just to check in with folks. I always wanted to keep a pulse on what was happening in the building and what was happening within the community itself to be very responsive. Um, also just creating a safe and comfortable place. So. I provided mental health services, not just for my scholars, but also for the staff. Mm. Because I just believe that adults come with so much, right? You already have your own baggage. You're dealing with stuff, your own childhood traumas, and you don't recognize how much working with young people who are dealing with their own traumas can be a trigger. Mm -hmm. um, so I would create a space where someone would come in twice a week. Um, Aaron Jenkins, he would come in twice a week from the day I opened the school for so far. He's even doing it to this day. Um, and I would give up my office because I wanted folks to know you're that important that I don't need to sit in my office for this. And my office was set up like it was, it was swagged out. So folks felt really comfortable. I would find somewhere else to go and they would sit and they would have, and I wanted someone, one of color, someone who understood the community mm -hmm. and three consistency. Because mm -hmm. we want to do the same for our adults as we do for our children. I also made it an important point to talk to parents, right? And I think that one of the things that we fail to do is share our own stories. Like, as an educator, I'm no better. I'm no bigger than anyone else. I can empathize with my parents because I know what it's like to be a single mom. I know what it's like to be a child of immigrants. I know what it's like to live in a, in a neighborhood filled with gangs. I know what it's like to deal with poverty. Like, I know all of these things. So I want you to know that I know your struggle to get your child to school. I, I want you to understand, I understand your struggle to get food on the table. 
I love you. I love your kids. I want you to be great. I want them to be great. And so when you're able to speak from a place of knowing or understanding and loving them through it and not saying, you should be doing better as a parent or as teachers, I need you to know X, Y, and Z. My question is, okay, so if you're, if you're struggling with your lesson planning, when I go into your classroom, let's sit down and go through the lesson plan together. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what happened with this outcome. Let's talk about why you didn't get there. If you just are willing to show up and people feel like you're invested in them, that in and of itself shows that you're empathetic because I'm not saying, oh, now that I'm sitting in an office and I have a title, I'm no longer a teacher. I'm always going to be a teacher because I'm an adult. I'm looking at a child and saying, well, you're a child and stay in your place. You're a child and you need to know what I'm saying and respect me as an adult, but I have to remember my role and what I was like as a child as well and what I was going through. So it requires presence. It requires humility because that's the other thing. People start power tripping once they get a title and they, fig they figure that they know all the answers. And I'm like, you know, somebody's going to humble you. If it's not somebody in this building, God will do it himself, right? And then just the other thing, just knowing that you want to be treated a certain way. So therefore you need to reciprocate that when it comes to the community you're serving. Yes, I love it. I love everything you just said. And the one thing, <laughs> so many things just, you know, I want to comment on. But the first <laughs> one is, is the triggers. Because I myself, you know, going into the high school, I had my own adverse childhood experiences. And this, those triggers from the students that actually, actually pushed me into what I'm doing right now, because it made me realize like, wow, I'm still not healed from that childhood trauma that I went through. And these exactly. kids are definitely not healed from it because most of them are still going through it as we speak. So I started thinking, how can I help these kids get to a point where they can heal much quicker than me? How can I help the educators understand that these students are suffering and this is their way of crying out for help and not being punished and expelled and suspended and things of that mm -hmm. sort. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And just being present, like you said, showing them that you care, that you can understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, letting them know that part of your story, like you said, you're a single parent, you've been there, you've done that. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times when the community and the students see our title, that's all they see. They assume that we've never been through anything and that we were born with silver spoons in our mouths and most of the times, that's furthest from the case. Um, but here's the other part of yeah. it. We walk like we were born with a silver stool in our mouth, right? We, we switch up. And it's like, why are you acting as though you are better than? Use your power with those who are in power, who are making your job difficult and oppressing the children and the adults in your building. Don't flex up on the people in your building. That yeah. makes no sense. Right. So you got to you got to understand, like, but the people that we, we speak about that are the lack empathy, they got another agenda. They're not concerned about healing in their space. They're not concerned about creating an opportunity for children to have voice, to allow adults to say, I'm not well or I need support. That's not what they're doing. They want to figure out how they can move up the ladder, how they can get into the central offices, how they can, you know, even flex on Twitter and be like, I'm that person. But at the end of the day, are the people in your building saying you're that person or are you the only one bigging yourself up? You got to figure out what your purpose is in life. And when you understand your purpose was given to you by the calling of what God put you to put in place, you need to roll with that because your legacy should be the children and the adults saying great things about you, not you always having to prove who you are. That just doesn't make sense to me. Right. And stepping on people's heads and not really caring about how you treat the people that's under you, just really having a focus on advancing. Yeah. that And I've come across those leaders and it's, it's always a toxic environment when that's the case. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely always a toxic environment. So one of my questions is, what were some of the things that you used for discipline? Because I know you were in, you know, one of the um, 
worst or I don't know what other word I should use, but one of the most violent, under-resourced uh, neighborhoods. So I know there were many behaviors. So what type of discipline measures did you usually use? So I want to be very clear because I think when people read Humans of New York, they were like, oh, this principal doesn't suspend kids. No, I absolutely suspended children who created safety issues. Yes. Like if you created a safety issue for anybody in the building, there's a non-negotiable that requires me to suspend you. However, there is a conversation that happens with the family, that happens with the child to understand what these consequences are why there has to be a suspension, and then there is a plan of action when this child returns, how to best support them. There's some ways you can't deviate from that because you may have injured someone else, you have caused harm, irreputable harm, so they're, they're, that's a non-negotiable. But before we get there, because I didn't have a high suspension rate, it's about the interventions, right? Mm -hmm. So there's easy ways for get, kids to get suspended and we talk a lot about it in terms of in the media you deal with a lot of girls who you know become sassy right and it's because hormone levels it's because of abuses that they've encountered at home and they're responding and acting out to that it's because their hair wasn't done it's because they had to bring their little brother and sister whatever it is so when it comes to issues in the building the question is what's going on tell me what's wrong today tell me what you're dealing with right because a lot of times kids act up and adults of course you're the adult and you don't want to hear anything else you got a curriculum to get through you know your day may have started off crazy and so you don't think about this child may be going through something sometimes the adults didn't have the capacity so myself my guidance counselor, director of programs, AP, support services, whoever. We would sit down and the first thing we would ask the child is tell us what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we would just give them wait time. Sometimes I would just put them in my office and let them just sit. Because sometimes they don't even have a place in their own homes that's quiet enough for them to just sit and think. And then be reflective and say, okay, so now that you have some time, can you talk to me or would you like some paper to write it down? There's some kids who be like, I write, I'd rather write it down. No problem. But it's not my job to sit here and persecute the child, right? It's my job to understand what's at the root of the cause. If they did something that might have been like yelling, screaming, um, throwing over a chair, okay, well, that means you're going to have to have lunch with me today. So we're going to sit. We're going to have lunch. We're going to talk. I might have you enter my book club because I had a bunch of kids who would just sit with me and we would start reading books. Um, it may mean that, you know, we're going to have an event this weekend and I need you to be here to help set up the event because sometimes children just need things to do as well and to feel important and feel like they have value as well. And you would see how so many of them would turn around, right? You would think because of the issues that they came in with one day that they would just be the worst of the worst. And the reality is that they're always having to be an adult somewhere mm -hmm. and they're never allowed to be a child. And so when they enter a building, sometimes they, they do like act up and they feel like they can confront adults because that's all they've known. That's how they've been raised. And you have to remind them you're a child. Mm -hmm. And so I need you to just bring it down 10 notches. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to fight with you because that's, that's, that's not, I'm not interested in that. And so those were the measures. So we did a lot around building children up mm -hmm. we found mentors for them i had the i matter program that was sponsored and and powered by um the brooklyn combine so it was a group of dynamic men as well as women who would come in they would teach them coding and before we were having this conversation about critical race theory you know like that that's turning everybody upside down in education that's what we were doing on saturdays talking to the children about how laws were created and how it actually was causing more harm to us. And it was based off of trying to continuously oppress us, right? We were having conversations about Haiti and the revolution of Haiti. We was having conversations about the lineage of kings and queens. Like we were having those conversations without having to ask permission to do those things. And so what you start to find is that when children were recognizing who they were, they started to understand the power within them. And then they started to realize that they were adults who were really invested in who they could become 
it created a shift, not only for them, but also for their families, because now it's a question of, damn, you always want to go to school? Absolutely. Because it's a safe space where they feel like they are learning and that yeah. they are going to do something significant as opposed to feeling like I'm all wrapped up in this neighborhood that keeps the perpetuation is will never be anything. And so it was just changing their mindset. I love it. And I, I love the thing that you do when you let the students in your office and you let them calm down and think for a minute, because <laughs> what that is really is allowing them to take care of themselves and showing them ways in which they could practice self care because self care sometimes is really just sitting alone, listening to your thoughts and reflecting. And like you said, some of the uh, kids' homes are so traumatic that they don't never really get time to do that. So I'm glad you offered that to the students and as well as just listening to them and understanding what's going on, understanding what happened to them, what's happening to them right now. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because when you come from that level of understanding, the students know that you love them and that you actually want the best for them. And you're not just there because of your title or because of your paycheck, because they get that so often. When you think about the turnover rate in urban mm -hmm. Title I um, schools, the turnover Absolutely. rate is almost double the national average. So they don't really but have... The, but the turnover rate is also because we make teachers or educators in general feel disposable, right? Yes, we don't recognize and say, I understand how hard your job is, right? The mandates, and oftentimes leaders are put in such a precarious situation because I'm being judged by the numbers. Yeah, I'm being measured by the success of how far these children are going on this test. And at the end of the day, I then start putting the pressure on my team. My team feels like I lack, I, 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 there was a point of when I love teaching, but there's nothing creative about this position. There's nothing about this that makes me feel like I'm making a difference. So if every single day I'm walking into a space and I feel defeated, like what else can I give to you? And so folks would rather leave. They always, you know, the, 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 the struggle is like, I don't want to leave the kids. But at the same time, me waking up feeling the way that I do, me feeling like I'm making it worse than I'm actually making it better and then always feeling like I'm the blame, I'm out of here. And they have every right to do that. So I always question like, so what are you doing in this space? How are your teachers able to use their voice to talk about what are the needs, right? I had a cabinet team that was comprised of eight teachers. They represented every single one of the um the disciplines, you know, math, science, ELA. I don't think I had social, I had social studies. I had special education. I had a paraprofessional. And then I had sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I had eight teachers. Plus I had my guidance counselor, my director of programs, my parent coordinator, my AP and myself, all in this room, making decisions about children. And then also asking them, so what do we need to do for the team? Exactly. What are they you understand? What do you need in order to lead the team? Because I'm not going to put it all on y'all and say, well, what are you doing? Because I don't see any growth or movement. What do you need? That's our responsibility. There's a lack of communication that happens. And oftentimes it's because we don't see it from the top. Top mm -hmm. comes in. All they do is evaluations. They tell us what's wrong and then they never come back. They're not giving you resources. They're not being empathetic. So if I'm constantly being graded and then chastised, I eventually become that very thing to my team. Yes. What I'm saying to folks is treat people how you were treated, even if somebody else isn't treating you good. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Be able to say, I recognize that the top isn't doing what they need to for me. But because I love you all and I want us to win because it's a us and we are a team. I'm going to do whatever it takes so that you feel like you're honored in this space. And what ends up happening, there becomes a reciprocation because as much as I'm pouring into my team, my team is going to protect me because they know I got their back. But when you don't do that, people are like, deuces, I'm good. I'm not staying here. Yes. Right. I, I, and that I, turnover is really, really high. 
is bananas. I remember the school that I was in every year, we would have at least 20 something staff leave. And it was because, you know, the atmosphere was just so toxic because like you said, you have the leaders that come in, they're not empathetic at all. They're just focused on the numbers. So they put that pressure on the principal. The principal is feeling that pressure. So they put it on the teachers and then the teachers put it on the students. So it really creates mm -hmm. that toxic cycle and it's not good for anybody because in all honesty, when it's like that, it, ju it just makes things worse. No one's really learning. No one's really enjoying themselves when they're at the job and they're just thinking of an exit strategy. Like, what can I do to get out of here to save myself, to save my health and my well-being? So I had my next question is, what do you do for self-care? Because I know now, like I said, because I follow you, that you've healed yourself. Um, you don't have the... Yeah. I don't know to what extent I can't say if you have it, you know, don't have it at all, but you've been able to heal yourself and you're not as sickly as you were. What types of things do you practice for self care? Um, so I am in full remission. I don't go to the doctor. Like when I was, when I was at the, yes, hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> um, when I was a principal, literally not so much a teacher, but when I was a principal, I was at the doctor's office before getting sick at least three to four times a year. And it was cyclical. It was like right after all the mandates in October, so right early November. Then like right around January when I'm going back to school. And then right around the state exams. And then right at the end of the year. So it was every every couple of months, right? But then I started going when it wasn't like, everybody would be like, what are you doing here? Like the entire team at the doctor's office would be like, why, why are you here? And so they always knew something was wrong. Um, so because I don't have the high stress, there's no need. I only go to the doctor once a year, right? Um, but what I do now is meditation is important, giving myself at least 10 to 15 minutes, whether it's just sitting in silence, maybe I'm listening to a guided meditation or I'm just praying. I could open up the Bible, I could read, or I'm just praying. Um, I walk. I'm not a runner. People will see me. I, I will have all I will have all the athletic gear, but it's not for me to run. It is because I like to be cute walking. <laughs> me too. So <laughs> I will walk. Um, I also do a lot of YouTube videos um, because it's free. And I, I like 30-minute walk workout that will allow me to sweat really good and I feel like I'm I can face the day. Um, but I also, I feel like it's important to give myself grace. So if I can't get to something, I'm not going to get to it. I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to make a note of it and I will do it tomorrow. Yes. I never used to do that. I would have to try to get it done within that same day so even if it's three in the morning four in the morning i'm still up i'm trying to get it done i'm not i'm not doing that anymore i have my moments because the aquarius in me is like oh keep going right like i have to get it done but it's not because i feel the pressure that someone is going to be coming after me that's not what i do the other thing that is very important um is that i started um so i have a what's called an accountability calendar Mm -hmm. right and I started it when I got sick so I'll kind of like I'll try to show y'all but I don't have the other one in here but this because I started it for the month of October so if you see here mm -hmm. I literally color code all my activities so I know how I spend my time so for me what's important is to have a lot of greens or at least to have a balance of greens and this color blue because what that means is if if it's a light color shade of blue and this I, I want y'all to understand, like, this is my life. Everything is color coded. I don't, I don't use regular pens. If I have a lot of the greens, that means I've done something for self care. That means I've, if I'm Netflix and chilling, mm -hmm. if I went to therapy that day, if I went for a walk, I stay accountable for my time. If I have the, the blues, that's like this color then that means I took time to learn something today. Mm. That means I wasn't teaching anybody. It meant that I learned something. So whether I read a book, I listened to a podcast, I actually took a course, I've invested in myself. And then I start looking at the other colors because I know the dark blue is that I meant, I, I 
spent a lot of time with my mother or my daughter. And so I try to make sure I have balance because my mother's a senior and she can monopolize my time. And I have to be like, so I, I, I need you to know I'm going to do this today, but I ain't doing it tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to find ways of balancing yourself. This actually helps to create boundaries. Yes. And I know many of us who are still in the workforce, right? Finding balance is really, really hard because the demands are there. But I'm going to say this. When you ask for your position, did you create a list of the things that you wanted for yourself? Because we walk into a position or an interview wanting a job. And what we got was a job. So true. We didn't walk into something that was designed based off of what we said we wanted. So if you didn't ask for, I want the type of position that I, I, I have time with my children. I want the type of position where I have opportunity for growth. I want the type of position where I know I'm going to be respected and the person who's ahead of me is always going to look out. I want the type of position where I feel safe and other people act safe amongst the, you know each other we walk in saying i just want this job yeah walk and in then we thirsty. get the job mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the job does what the job does it mm -hmm. gives what it gives mm -hmm. it's gonna give you all of the drama it's gonna introduce you to all of the traumas it's going to it's going to drain you of everything and i want you to know that's not your fault because no one taught us that Mm -hmm. No one taught us to be very clear with our non-negotiables. But then when we walk into a position, guess what you get? You get a handbook with all the non-negotiables. You signed off on it. You can't say you ain't know what you was getting into. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to start saying for yourself, what's my non-negotiables? Because you're the asset. I have to be out of here by yes. 4.35 o'clock. Yes. If you never say that and you walk into this job and they got you working till six or seven, they're looking at you, but then you understand that that's what you signed up for. And you're like, no, I didn't do that. But did you tell somebody that that's not what you're going to do? Mm -hmm. When you start identifying and making your list and saying, these are the things that I want from a position, you'll be fine. You'll be able to say, to the position that comes along. When they're not saying the things you need to hear, it's easy for you to be like, so that's not the place. Or if you're in that place right now, make your list. What do you need right now at this very moment to feel like a human being, to exist, to not have that angst that you wake up, that anxiety, your heart racing, your head is already hurting, the anticipation, all the things we go through to get to the job. What are the things that you need to not feel that way. And if you have a list, who can you speak to about some of those issues? If you're working too late, who can you sit down and say, so this is, these are my responsibilities and I can't do it. This is what I can do. How could we manage? If the people are saying to you, no, you have to. If you're in a, if you have so many kids, because now we're in a position where there's so many children who have special needs, but there's not enough special needs teachers, right? Mm -hmm. I need support. Am I going to get professional development? Are we going to find somebody? Is there going to be a power professional? What are we doing? If they're not answering those questions, you need to memorialize these things in an email. You need to send it to someone because the minute someone walks into your room and you don't have a special ed teacher in your classroom, who do you think they're going to hold accountable? It's you. Mm -hmm. But then when you realize you're getting to the end of next year, don't, don't, Go back to that job next year feeling the same way. You know what you needed in order to flourish. And if you do not have that and you do not speak to it, and if you do speak to it and the people are not responding, then you as an adult have a responsibility to say, it's time for me to transition. And that is so true. And it's sad at the same point because many times when you go into the jobs, your non-negotiables non just aren't met because of the state of the education system. You know, they really could give two cracks about the educators. And, and it's sad because, you know, they're just focused on um, test scores, test scores, test scores. And they're not focused on the educator self-care. They're not focused on educator mental health or any of those things. What has happened over this last year since, you know, the pandemic and all, a lot of leaders are leading towards that 
but it hasn't always been that way in the past. And that's why you see like a lot of the burnout because again, like why would you stay in a place where you know you're not valued, you're really not getting anything out of it and it's bringing you nothing but stress. I'm so glad you said that. Um, and we have to take a stand pretty much. And again, it's unfortunate mm -hmm. because there's a huge teacher shortage right now because of all of the things that you just named. But if we never stand up for ourselves and say, this is what I'm going to take and this is what I'm not going to take, the system is never going to change. And it's just going to continue to burn out all the good educators and then bring in, bring in all of the ones that just want to sit there to collect a check and could really care less about the kids. You know, they're, they're like, um, I'm in, you know, a lot of teachers come into urban neighborhoods because maybe they couldn't find a job in their desired district. So, you know, the urban mm -hmm. district is the one that hired them first and they come in there with that type of attitude. Like, I'm just here to collect the check. They have all these different stereotypes about the students that they're serving and they never take time to actually get to know the students and the communities and all. So it's really just a huge recipe for disaster. And I'm glad so you're like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna interrupt you, right? Cause there's two ways of looking at it. So one, every time I would do an interview, the at the end of the interview, the question is always, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. And teachers would never ask a question about what are the type of supports, mental, do you have mental health supports in the school? Do you, um, what is the professional development? They'll ask about professional development, but they won't ask like specific questions. And you know what? The reason why is because they don't know what to ask. Exactly. A lot of times people exactly. are so green, they don't know what to ask, right? Which is why it's important that if you get into the profession and you're fairly new, or if you've been in the profession and it's, you're now going to transition to new positions, whether it's leadership or it's another teacher position, ask other teachers, what should I ask? What are some things that you wish you would have known walking into this building? We have to do that. It's no longer okay for you to walk into a school and just accept anything. You have to understand the culture has been this way because people kind of went into teaching. They were the ones who really loved it. And then we got to a position where people didn't love it and they were just career changes, including myself. But I understood why I was going into the profession. I wasn't willing to become a teacher unless I was willing to do what it was required of me, right? And there is no accountability from the school standpoint of making sure teachers have what they need. Right. There are principals who are doing that work. There are principals who are in the trenches with their team. But the unfortunate part is that we don't highlight them. We always highlight what's wrong with schools. We always highlight that there's gaps. We always highlight that the kids are not reading well. But we never actually say, okay, so where does, where's the root coming from? We don't talk about the fact that kids aren't reading on grade level because they don't have books in their households and their parents can't read. We ain't talking about that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about well, what did the school fail to do? So unless you start changing the narrative as an educator and start saying to a person, if you go in an interview, ask them the questions. Don't feel like I don't want to ask them because they might not give me the job. If they're not going to give you the job, that's not the place you need to work mm -hmm. because there's nothing about you stepping into that place that's going to change anything. On the flip side of it is, that's the part where the teacher needs to ask the question. On the other side of it is that, you know, principals are recognizing that people are leaving and their jobs are getting even more difficult. It's like, you know, when we talk about the, the buyer's market for, for houses and stuff like that, this is, this is the teacher and guidance counselor's market because principals, like, it's bad enough all the things we have to go through during the school year, but when you think about the summertime, principals in New York City are year-round educators. They don't have time off. They got 14 days that they have to figure out over a period of two and a half months when they're going to take off. And so it is important that folks say what they need as well because that principal has been all year just trying to put out fires has been trying to deal with the quality review, has to do the evaluations, has to do this, has to do that. Sometimes they get so much tunnel vision and they're so exhausted that they don't even know. Yes. So it's important to say, I need you to recognize that there's some issues here. You have to advocate for yourself. It's a school community. 
And when, when we all become complacent or we start to say we can't or we don't feel like it or that nothing's going to change, then don't stay in the same place that nothing is going to change in, right? Either you get a group of y'all together and start saying, create your own committees. And people are going to be like, well, I shouldn't have to do that. You know, I'm, I, I get paid for X, Y, and Z. If your attitude is, I shouldn't have to do that and I get paid for X, Y, and Z, that's not the school for you. Sometimes things can't change because the person who's at the helm of the principal doesn't have the capacity. You cannot put the onus on one person. And I'm going to always go back to the question, why are you there? If you don't trust this person, if this person is abusive and disrespectful to you, and you feel like you can't change anything, why are you there? Mm -hmm. Don't say it's because of the kids. I have to stay. I have to protect them. Kids are resilient. And at the end of the day, those children will graduate from that school. You'll still be there while they've moved on. Why are you there? Leaving does not make you a quitter. It makes you say, I need to do something that's good for me because I need to be the very best for children. You find the places that honor you so that you can continue to be an educator because those same kids will find you. They will see you. And you still remain an example to them. When you stay in an abusive place, you are literally telling children to accept abuse. We cannot do that anymore. It's like when, when you say that, it's like um, a parent, mom or dad, being in an abusive relationship. Absolutely. They're modeling that being abused is okay. So the, you know, their kids are going to believe that it's okay. Yes. I, that was right on point. Right on point. What would you say is the biggest challenge you faced as a school leader? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there was just one thing. I think one, the biggest challenge, the first biggest challenge was ever finding balance because ultimately that's what affected my, my ability to continue on as a school leader, right? Um, creating those boundaries and saying no because the way it was set up was I never felt like I was doing enough and no one else was taking accountability for what they weren't doing to support me. Yes. So, yes. You know, that that for me was um the greatest challenge and in turn having to fight the very system that says that it's putting children first, but it wasn't putting children first when it was putting me and my team in harm's way. <laughs> like, you know, so the challenge was always trying to remain present even in my, you know, my functioning burnout and still give that all I, I could give to create the change that children deserved, right? Because I also understood that we had to get this right. For every child that sat in our class, we weren't just affecting them, we were affecting generations. And so if we didn't get it right with this child, we could be affecting their children and their children's children. So for me, it became even more personal because it was like, we this this is what we have to do so the challenges was the balance which was my health and then also being able to not always feel defeated and because i was always fighting this system the system was doing what it needed to do yes but always. i was like now well, not while i'm here <laughs> not right, right here with these children um so that that definitely were the challenges and fighting the system can burn you out it, alone. You don't need oh, to anything yeah, on top of that. So I completely understand that. What would you say was like your most enjoyable part as a school leader? Oh, there were so many. I love my kids. I love them. I, those, those were my children. I didn't birth them. I love them. You know, it's just... I had really great relationships with them. Um, I had staff members who were literally like family. Um, it was something about walking the hall and seeing us, the ability to create something in a place where when on the outside it was chaotic, but on the inside it was just one of the most peaceful spaces. Um, the programming, the partnerships, 
the people that would come from all over the world to this place to see our children and to see the adults. And I will always not make it about me. I wanted them to go into the classroom. Like they wanted to talk to me. I want you to see my teachers. I want to see, I want you to see how much they're rocking out in the classroom. Like those were the things. I loved everything about my position in my building with my folks that had nothing to do with compliance, that had nothing to do with these policies, that had nothing to do with anything else. I miss it mm-hmm. and I loved it. I love it. And I'm I'm in total agreement with you because I always say that I have I have a whole bunch of kids. You know, they're the kids that I actually birthed. And those are the kids, uh, my other kids are my students. So when I say my kids, people never really know what kids I'm talking about. I have to be specific. Exactly. So I definitely get it. And you're able just to form, like, you really do become family. Like, a lot of my um, old students have my cell phone numbers. A couple of them call me aunt now. Or, you know, mm-hmm. whenever they're in making a big decision or going through something mentally, they'll call mm-hmm. me, they'll text me. And that just shows the level of respect that they have and how um, tightly knit that relationship is because those relationships can literally last forever if you continue to nurture them and it really does transform the students lives because now they see that there's there's there, there is someone <laughs> there by their side no matter what you know like mm-hmm. no matter what they're going mm-hmm. through and maybe if they need to leave the house and just come see you you know you, you meet up and take them to get lunch or something you know yeah. just just so they can talk to you and get whatever is on on their mind get it off of their mind because mm-hmm. many times the students don't really have someone that they can trust and that they they can talk to just to listen without giving them that type of unsolicited advice so i'm i'm so glad you you said that um just to wrap it up I mm-hmm. want to know what is one piece of advice that you would give to new school leaders just coming in Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know if there's one piece of advice I can give them um, because I think that that's not fair. The job is so complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. I actually, I saw a couple of um, the folks who are in my rec room. I have uh, aspiring leaders and APs and principals who I coach. And, you know, the first thing I always say to them is, one, you have to create boundaries. You know, for me, the most important thing is creating boundaries for yourself and not being hard on yourself because this job will make you feel like you're doing absolutely nothing, right? So Mm -hmm. know that you are only in control of the things that you are able to do. Um, The second thing is just know where to expend your energy because a lot of times we're putting out fires all day and we don't have to, but it's because if you lack the coaching to direct you to say, that's not important, let's move, let's do this other thing and focus, you'll find yourself doing 10 different things at one time. Um, And no one is going to say, you need to stop and get it under control because they just want you to keep doing it, right? And even if it's going to kill you, it's not killing them. Um, Mm -hmm. But then the other thing is that you cannot be afraid to say that you don't know. Yes. You know, um, I found that in, in leadership, it may, they, there's this idea that you have to feel weak, right? And you, if you need help in any capacity, mental health, right? I'm not saying for you to call everybody, you know, in the school district and say, I need some mental health support. Get the mental health support you need. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel like I can't, I'm a school leader. I can't do that. This job is hard. And there are things that you don't even recognize that you are carrying from your past that is actually influencing you right now. So if you're constantly saying yes and trying to please people, that could be something that you're dealing with in your past. If you're easily Mm -hmm. triggered and you have anger and all of these things, that could be easily from your past, your early adulthood. There's things that we have to settle within ourselves to be better in the position that we're in. Because sometimes we're even in school because we're trying to fix our younger version of ourselves and we can't do that. So you have to be okay with saying, I need to, I need to heal myself. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that just know you can't do this alone. I don't care how they put it. You cannot do this alone. 
So get your lifelines, you know, um, find out who you can trust because that's important. You got to find out who you can trust and be willing to connect um, because we don't grow in isolation. You always grow in relationships. I love it. So to wrap it up, let everyone know um, about your book, where to find you and what other offerings you have going on. You mentioned the rec room and whatever you have going on, just let the people know so they can show you some love. Um, so you can follow me at the Lopez effect. I don't have anything in front of me. Like I wish I would have set up my whole table, but I didn't. I apologize y'all. Um, but I have, a, I do rec room three times a year for the fall winter and spring however the fall has already been sold out without me even putting it out there um so in this uh winter and spring i will be offering it's an eight-week course that supports leaders and you have a cohort so you can have your support system because you need that is really really important next week i'm going to be hosting the heart of the matter it is going to be a webinar that's free so please sign up for that i'm going to be putting it up either tonight or tomorrow um, but basically, it allows and you what is to... that about? So it's focusing... The heart is actually an acronym. And once we get through the acronym, it will help you determine if this is the place you need to stay or if it's time for you to go, right? And then by the time we're oh, done, no. the webinar is an hour, you would come away with strategies and the ability to create an action plan for what's next in your life. Um, my book, The Bridge to Brilliance, is available for sale on Amazon, but I also have a companion to it, which is um, a workbook. Really great for educators, for teachers especially, but also for leaders to guide and support their teachers. That's on my website, elevatedblk.com, www.elevatedblk.com. Um, and then I'm going to be doing a vision class. And so people who, I'm a visionista, I manifest everything. I put it down on paper and I'm very, I'm, I'm serious about what I do. Right. And so people who have taken it when you are ready, cause it's not a play play thing. You are ready to take yourself to the next level. It's a two, uh, two, it's two court, two series course. Um, you get your whole life together. I'm going to be doing that in November. So you can find a lot of that again on www.elevatedblk.com. You could DM me, but again, if you follow me, you'll find all of the information. Awesome. So make sure that y'all check out everything she has going on. It's elevatedblk.com, um, which is her website. If somebody could put that in there and pin it, that would be great. I want to thank you so much for this conversation. This conversa conversation was <laughs> much needed. What your wisdom, and I could just see the comments. People are really feeling it. Um, you have someone checking in from Ghana on here. Your friend Sarita, like you were saying, she's like, you're the best principal ever, you know, hands down, you're the GOAT. Um, and it was just a, a lot of really good remarks in here. I didn't see any questions, but I, I want to thank everybody for showing up and showing out. I see my daughter um, jumped on. My daughter just jumped on, Sine, and then one of my three um, former teachers, Miss Dolphin. Like, you know, thank y'all for taking your time out on um this wednesday you could have been anywhere in the world and so we appreciate that and honestly i do want to say please continue to support nicole right these conversations are important for us to be transparent and for you to know that you're not alone like you're not alone in this process the system is not designed to support you we have to redefine what that looks like um, and so if you take away anything from this conversation or other individuals' conversation, it's just to know that you have to have the audacity to make the change and you have to be willing to get your village involved, right? I don't want anybody to end up like me. It's not fair to my family. It wasn't fair to myself. But I do understand that also God wanted to give me a testimony to show you all that you don't have to kill yourself to make change. So, you know, I hope everyone can be well. Um, and as I said, please support, support, support Nicole. She's out here. She's doing this work. Um, and you are an influencer as well. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be on your platform. Thank you. And thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I wish you nothing but the best. I know you have a bright future wherever it is you're headed, whatever type of pivot you're making, because you're doing it from the heart. You're doing it um, for purpose and you're not out there for the wrong, wrong reasons. So just support her as much as y'all possibly can. Um, it's hard to do the work, you know, it's hard. <laughs>
and, and it can be very challenging at times. But I want to thank you so much for giving me your time, Dr. Lopez, and everyone that joined on as well. And I will see y'all next week for episode two of Leading with Empathy. See y'all tomorrow. Not Well, see y'all whenever I'm back on here. All right, see you. <laughs>